Well, thank you guys for being here. And I just wish that I could like make a phone call and get this many people in one room. That's just incredible. So thanks for that. I mean, for inviting me down. Um, this is going to go for, I promised I'd be done by 530. So if that's okay, it should be all right. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I like this. Here. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about cost segregation and more generally real estate, as many of you guys know, and maybe some of you don't, is probably one of the best vehicles for building wealth in the tax code. And the things we're going to talk about are things that the government wants you to take advantage of, and that's really important to understand. Because we're going to talk about some accounting concepts, and as we go through those, hopefully the, it will resonate how those ultimately turn into cash, which can then be reinvested and continue to build things. If you do this correctly, you never pay taxes. Say it again. If you do this right, and I'll show you how, you would never have to pay taxes. And it's kind of a cool little gig because there's very few of these left in the tax code. Okay? So we're going to start with transparency because I'm a big fan of that. So how many people say they are comfortable reading a financial statement? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Good. We're going to talk slow. Um, all right. We're going to start there. Uh, where's my oh, podium? The podium there. there we go. Thanks. All right. And then on the side, there's a little on switch. Sorry. There we go. Cool. All right. Okay. Whenever I do presentations, we go through program objectives, which are really just the things that hopefully you'll take away when we get done. So today we're going to talk through just defining cost segregation. That's going to take literally 30 seconds. Then we're going to spend the next 45 to 50 minutes explaining what that means. We're going to recognize, more importantly, how you save money using cost segregation. Uh, we're going to talk through this concept called depreciation, which is the key behind all of the cost seg work that we do and why it generates the tax savings that it does. And then we're going to talk about something called a 1031 exchange. How many people have heard of that? Cool. We're going to go through some of the mechanics, just as kind of a review so that you understand some of the do's and don'ts behind those. Okay. So real quick, Asina Consulting has been my company since 2009. I actually changed my title to founder and head coach because presidents don't really do anything, and I found I wish I could do that, but I never get a chance to do nothing. Um, I have spent most of my career doing tax. I started with a small company called Arthur Anderson, for those who remember those guys. Um, and I left the company, and about five, six years later, the company went under. I'm not making any correlations. It happened. Um, and I left tax for a while because while it was fun, I was in the compliance group. And compliance is... Well, it's compliance. It's not a lot of fun. The reason I got into tax was because of the very cool things you could do with it to lower taxes and that we don't pay any tax. But that's not what I got to do when I got to Arthur Anderson, and it was a great run when I was there. Some things changed in the tax code, and some friends called me back and said, you might want to check some of this stuff out, and that brought me back, and that was in 2004. And I've been involved in tax incentives ever since then. Okay. A lot of that work's been cost seg. It's a big part of our practice at Asina. And in the last year, I think we've been growing at a rate of about 40% a year for the last four years on the cost seg alone. Okay, so let's define cost segregation. When we think of a building or we think of a property, there's really three pieces to it. One is the land, right? Land under all the buildings unless it's a condom. And then the second piece is the building. And then there's a lot of other stuff, right? Other stuff. And we call that personal property. That's your furniture, that's your flooring, that's your carpet. That's all the little things that are in every building, but they're not going to last the length of the building. So what cost segregation allows us to do is separate personal property from the building. There you go. That's my 30 seconds. That's cost saving. Okay. We're going to talk about what depreciation is, but essentially what happens is personal property, because it wears out faster, you can expense it or take advantage of the cost of it more quickly, more quickly than a building which is either 39 or 27 and a half years. We're going to get into that in just a second. Okay, so why do we care about accelerated depreciation? Question for you guys. If I, have, if I go out and I buy a $10 million building, am I out of pocket $10 million? No. How much am I out? A couple million, right? I only got to put 25, 30% down. The rest of it comes from the bank. This goes on your balance sheet. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the financial statements in just a second. 
But then what the government allows me to do is take a little bit of that $10 million each year against my taxable income. That's depreciation. So commercial building, I get to take a big 1 39th of it of that $10 million. Now, that's not a lot, right, when you look at that kind of money. But if I could take that building over five years, right, that's going to lower or reduce or rip completely out my taxable income. That's the concept of depreciation. And that's why cost segregation is such a cool thing. So how does this help us from a tax perspective? Well, now we need to dig a little bit and unpack the Internal Revenue Code. And as Tara pointed out, it is the single largest body of tax law in the country, bigger than anything else. And I can promise you, thanks to Congress, it's not getting any easier. It's kind of cool. So no CPA knows all of it. Most of us know about this much of it. And the concept is how, much, how deep can you go? Can you go 10 miles and know just this much 10 miles deep? So I'm going to take you into this top layer here and just talk about these concepts from the code section perspective because the definitions are important as we go into cost segregation. So section 1245 is your personal property. We define it this property that you have to depreciate. We're going to talk about expense versus depreciation in a second. And it is not a building. I love the way lawyers write, right? It's something, but it's not something else. If I've got examples, it's going to be furniture and fixtures, carpet, electrical fixtures, electrical costs for phones, automobile trucks, and land improvements. Land improvements, asphalt, concrete, landscaping. I can pull this out of the building. Okay, take them over 15 years rather than 40, 39. Section 1250 is the building. That's your structure. That one has to stay in either 39 years if it's commercial or 27 and a half years if it is residential. Who can tell me when a residential property would be 39 years? Anybody have any Airbnbs? Okay, that's considered a commercial property. Even though it's a residential building, we end up taking that as a commercial property. It's treated like a hotel. Commercial buildings, warehouses, rental properties, and other structural components. Okay, summarizing that, real property on one side, personal property on the other. Cool concept I'm gonna share with you guys about cost segregation. How you use one of these pieces, these components, is important. The electrical system of the building does what? It serves the building, right? But when we put a bunch of tenant improvements in and we put in some walls and things, what do we do? We add electrical. If I have a factory and I'm going to put a bunch of machines in, what do I do? I add a bunch of 240 outlets, right, all along so my machines can run. Those don't serve the building, right? They serve the business. Guess what we can do in cost save? They become five-year property. Kind of cool. Okay, let's talk about depreciation. A balance sheet is what you own and what you owe. An income statement is what you calculate for your taxable income. If something is gonna last more than one year, definitionally it is supposed to be an asset and go on your balance sheet and it would not positively impact your taxable income. It's not gonna help you. That's why your building is depreciated. So we're gonna take that building and we're gonna take just a little of it and offset our taxable income each year over 27 and a half or 39 years. Does that make sense? Are you following me so far? Okay, so an expense is important. What else do I know about that building, right? I just spent $10 million, most of it, thanks to the bank. And I put it on my balance sheet and I'm gonna take a little bit of it over here on my income statement. In my out cash when I take that over, it's a non-cash expense. I'm saying it again. The depreciation that comes over to your income statement is a non-cash expense. I'm not out of pocket. Remember that because we're going to go through some examples that are going to highlight that. That's really important. Depreciation is what goes on your income statement. Our balance sheet has our building on it. That's all right. Okay. In the code, under 167, this is what allows us to do that. By the way, you're never going to find cost segregation in the Internal Revenue Code. It doesn't exist. This is a result of court cases. And there's about 15 of them that are kind of landmark. But it's something that, that, that you will find lots of stuff from the IRS that 
essentially blesses the way that we do this. So how do we do this? We take the cost of the building less our depreciation that gives us something called an adjusted basis. As you own a building and take depreciation, your adjusted basis goes down. When you sell the building, your gain is calculated by taking the sale price of the building minus the adjusted basis. Okay, not this one, not the cost. What we've already taken is depreciation. That's what's going to generate that taxable income, our, our gain on the property. That's important as well. Okay, quick calculation here. We're going to go through three examples. We buy a building for $10 million. $8 million is the building. $2 million is the land. It's residential. If I divide that out, it's going to be $290,000 of depreciation to reduce our taxable income by $290,000 a year. In year one, it's going to leave me with an adjusted basis of $9.7 million. Everybody with me still? Okay. Okay. There's my 9.7 on my tax on my tax return. Just for fun, we generated $960 million of revenue. That's the rent that I received from my tenants. I had operating expenses of 480, which leaves me with $480,000 of net income. I have 290,000 of depreciation. Didn't come out of pocket for that, right? Non-cash. So I've actually got 480,000 of cash. My taxable income is 189, tax due is 75,000. Still with me? All right. Example two. Now when we bought this building, it happened that there was furniture in the building that we picked up that was valued at $500,000. So $10 million, my building is 7.5, 500 land. You can see now that my depreciation has gone up because furniture, I get to take over five years. So there's 100,000, my depreciation goes up to 372. All that reduces, so now my adjusted basis now is down to 9.6 million. There's your basis over here. On this side now, my tax is down to $42,000 because I had 500 grand of furniture in the property. I like that. Now let's see what happens when we add in a cost sake study. On a residential building, it is not uncommon for us to find 25% of the basis of the building and be able to convert that to personal property. $10 million, now the building is only six because I found $2 million of personal property. My land is still at $2 million. I can't depreciate land, by the way. Land is land. Building depreciation at 218, personal property at 400, total depreciation of six, it takes me down to 9.3 million. There's my revenue, it's all the same. There's my depreciation. Now I've got a tax loss and I have no tax due. I just saved $75,000 in cash. How much money do I have available to invest? Do I have $75,000? Yeah. How much do I have to invest? I have 302,000, right? Because that 75,000 is going to get paired with a bank loan for 75% of the next value. So that cost sake study just allowed me to buy another building for 300 grand. And reality, let me back up a second, is that that's non-cash. So I don't really just have 75,000, do I? I've got $480,000 of cash to put in. Multiply that times four. That's what you really have available. That's the power of a cost sake study. Isn't it cool what I get to do every day? <laughs> this is fun. I have somebody else go visit the property. I was just curious, since the tax loss here is negative, can you, you can carry that forward to the next year too, right? We do. Yeah. Unless, and this is a, an advanced concept which we're not going to cover today, if you are designated as a real estate professional under the tax code, you can use that loss to offset active income, your W-2 income. So not only would you get that benefit, but you'd also get to pick up no tax on $138,000 of your W-2 income. If you are not a real estate professional, then you're limited. And that's right, that would carry over into next year. Make sense? Everybody still with me? Cool. All right. All right. So let's talk a little bit about improvements. You buy a building, you will go in, you decide, you know what, I don't like the kitchen, I don't like the bathrooms, I'm going to change the flooring, I don't like this wall, I need a new fireplace, whatever it happens to be that you're going to do. So improvements add to the basis, right? You're coming out cash, you're out cash. So 
from a detailed perspective, what I like to what I like to see is great documentation. I want to see the receipts. I want to know specifically because that's going to help our engineers to actually put values on all of those and put them in the right class life so we can maximize that depreciation. There's another concept, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, called bonus depreciation, which for 2023, anything that is personal property, you get to take 100% depreciation on. In 23, it went to 80%, 24, it's going to go to 60%. 40%, 20%, unless they change it in the tax law. Another cool feature you're going to like too, if you bought the building in 2021, when bonus depreciation was at 100% and you're only doing a cost save now in 2024, guess what? You get all of it, you get 100%. A lot of things that don't get picked up when people do cost saves or disposals, you're going to rip out walls, you're going to take out countertops, you're going to change the cabinetry. That was something you paid for when you bought the building. So we should remove it from our cost basis, right? And that is automatic depreciation. So not only do we get that bonus depreciation on the stuff that we just put in, but we're also going to get all of the cost of those disposals that we just pulled out. So we'll go in and make sure that we grab everything that got ripped out and pick that up as well. OK? All right. So what are the takeaways here? If you do this right, you're going to live tax-free, at least from your real estate investment portfolio. Okay? You're going to generate cash flow. Cash is king. Cash flow is king. And then lastly, you're hopefully going to see a lot of appreciation. Now, we know that we're going to go into a down cycle, except I hear it, that's not really happening here, right? You guys are still on the... Yeah, it's slow, but it's not really going down. That's fantastic. Unbelievable. Wow. Okay. So not taking advantage of something like a cost seg study, there's only one time I think you wouldn't do that, and that is if you're going to sell it next year. Remember I said as we take that depreciation, we reduce your cost basis, right, that you get that adjusted basis number that keeps going down. Well, if I spend money and get a cost seg done, and I save all this money this year, and I then turn around and sell it next year, I have to recapture all of that as gain, and I'm going to pay tax on it. So. Unless you're going to take that money and have a nice return on it in one year, which some people can, not sure that it makes a lot of sense. So typically, this is going to be a, a strategy that you're going to hold the property for a period of time. Now, another question for you. Is there a way that I can buy a property and never pay tax on the, on the game? Only if you don't sell it, right? How do you not sell it? You will it to your kids. When you will it to somebody, the tax law allows you to get a step up in basis to market value. So let's say we bought that $10 million piece of property. We did a cost seg on it. We've been holding on to it. We've got it down where our basis is down to about $6 million. We pass away. Give it to our kids. Tax law says, well, the property's worth $12 million. Kids get it for $12 million. They'd never pay tax on it if they sold it. I love tax, and it's fun. <laughs> yes. You guys didn't know we were gonna have so much fun today, right? All right. Okay. So let's talk about a 1031 exchange. By the way, President Biden's talking about getting rid of these. That's just an FYI. So you know. 1031. Is this a tax-free exchange? Deferral. Okay, we're deferring it. Simplest form. You sell a property, you buy another one. If you do it correctly, you don't pay tax on the gain. You get to use the entire amount of the sale price to go buy something else. And you defer the gain until the future. Okay. So 1031, we're just going to postpone that gain. Um, it includes cash liabilities and property. It happens in a number of different ways. It can be simultaneous, which almost never happens. It can be deferred, where you've got a period of time, and we're going to walk through what that time period looks like. Um, or it can be a reverse exchange where you buy something and then you sell your other property sort of in a reverse fashion, but those can be um, blessed as well as 1031 exchange. Who qualifies? Owners of investment and business properties. That could be in a C Corp, S Corp, LLC, trust, partnership. The form doesn't really matter. What happens after is what matters. And so talking to your CPA about the right type of uh, corporate vehicle is really, really important. Okay, trader business investment, it must be in the same nature, character, or class. Okay. 
And then lastly, you can't sell something in the U.S., go buy something overseas and expect to get some kind of a tax-free exchange on that thing. They kind of frown on that. <laughs> okay. okay. What are the time limits? After we sell, we've got 45 days to identify a replacement property. Now, that doesn't mean you can walk out and say, I like that one. Yeah. Got to be in writing. Got to be signed by the other people. It's got to be a legitimate, I've identified this as something I might want to buy. And you can identify as many as you like. That's fine. But it needs to be in writing, clearly describing the property. The address is always good. Okay. And delivered to the whoever it is that you're looking to purchase from. You have to finish the exchange within 180 days, or if your tax return is due, that comes first in the year of the sale. Okay, so that's really important. A lot of people go, I've got 180 days if I sold it, you know. Let's just make sure we get under that. Could you just do a tax extension to avoid that? It includes extensions. Okay. Yeah. Good, good thought. Okay. Um, now, here's the key. I can identify 10 properties and then go pick something else, but it's got to be close. I can't just pick 10 at random and then pick something completely different. So the IRS is looking for you to make this kind of legitimate in terms of what you're identifying. So what do you not want to do? You don't want to take control of that cash. There are companies out there that are certified exchange agents that when you are getting ready to buy and sell, you get them involved. So the proceeds from the sale go to them, not to you. If you handle that cash, they're going to tax you. You're going to get hit with that game. So best to hand it over to exchange agent where you don't have any um, hands on it. And when it's time to buy, they're going to be the ones that are going to hand over that cash for you. So you may not use your broker, investment banker, accountant, attorney, or an employee as your facilitator. You've got to use somebody completely third party outside. And lastly, you cannot act as your own facilitator. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the adjusted basis. And while I do a lot of this work, I always ask my client's CPA to calculate the basis because they're the ones who are going to put it on the tax return. They've got to be comfortable with it, but it's not an easy calculation. Um, but we're looking at the purchase price of the acquired property, the proceeds from the sale excluding debt, the sale price of relinquished property minus the basis and the sales commissions paid. So if we're looking at an example, I purchased real estate at 800000 my basis of what I sold was 500. The sale price was 750 minus commissions. So you take your proceeds at 694, right? 750 minus 56. You got your 800. Additional investment of 106,000 was put into this particular deal, and that's fine. You don't pay tax on it if you're coming out of pocket that cash. Subtracting out that that basis, you're left with 606,000. I paid eight. But what's going to go on my tax return is 606. So that when ultimately I sell this property, I'm going to pick up the gain from the first sale, but that could be 10 years from now. So you've still got the use of that money until that happens. Questions? Whenever there's questions, it's never a good sign. Either you didn't understand any of it or I was really good. And I know I'm not that good. Uh, you alluded to this, but I just want to make sure everybody understood because, like, when we did our cost saves, a lot of those were not properties we bought that year. Some of them were several years old. So, I think sometimes people may think they can only do it in the year that they bought it, but you can yep. go backwards. Great question. So, um, as you guys know, right, if you don't, we'll explain it, right? You're taking that 139th or 127th per year of depreciation. When you do that cost seg, we do what's called a catch up. So, we're going to catch up all the depreciation you didn't take in those prior years as if it happened then. That's that's why when we talked about bonus depreciation, if you bought it in one of those years where it's 100% bonus depreciation, even though I'm not doing my cost seg until now, I'm going to pick up all that as if it was 100%. So yeah, so it doesn't matter the year that you do it, we're going to get to pick up all that depreciation and carry it forward and take it in the year that we take the cost seg. It comes a change of accounting method of your tax return. And so after you do that the following year, you'll still be able to take the depreciation off the building that 39 and a half yep. worth. It's yep. just not as much, so that's why you just need to go buy another property, right? That's right. So, right, you guys noticed in those examples, in that first one we had a lot of depreciation, the second one we had a little less depreciation for the building because we took it as personal property. 
third year we had a little bit less because we took more in personal property. When you do a cost seg and you've got a big chunk up front, then what's left for that depreciation over 27 or 39 years is going to be less each year. So it goes down. So what's happening, and if I lose you, just stop me, raise your hand, and I'll slow it down and back it up. A cost seg study, it gives you an interest-free loan from the government, right? You're, your depreciation, because it goes lower in those following years, you're paying, but you're essentially paying back. You're paying a little bit more tax in those succeeding years. Are right? you getting a big tax break in this year? But then we're going to pay a little bit back to the government every year. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Um, first time I did one of these, probably 15 years ago, this time's presentation, man, the backstop goes, it's just a timing difference. Yeah, that's right. But if I can make 15 or 20 or 30% of my dollar today, I'll take that timing difference all day long to the bank. That's a good one, right? So it is a timing difference. The real question becomes, how good are you at investing that money that you just saved by not paying tax on it? You're gonna go buy a boat, use it for business, that means you get some bonus depreciation on it. Okay, anything else? Cool. Uh, so if, if, let's say I buy a house in 2017 mm -hmm. and my tax accountant is obviously depreciating the house. I remodel the house slightly. Let's yep. say paint, countertops, flooring, et cetera, et cetera. We write off, I say write off, expense those as improvements. You're stating basically anything that's in there over the next five years, I can depreciate the internal items, cabinets, countertops, fixtures, lighting, the whole shebang. Yeah. Even though I take a deduction or whatever. You don't get to double dip. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, so yeah, no, if we took dip. all of those improvements and said those improvements are deductible, I don't get the cost saving. So so let's so let's so so earlier on I said that anything that has one more than one year useful life is supposed to be capitalized as an asset and depreciated over five years in, in your example. So he should have been doing that over five years versus an right. now if we get bonus depreciation so as we put on the balance sheet, we're able to take that bonus depreciation and we could expense it right away. You're not going to get to do it again and again and again. So it depends on the tax law at that moment. But we want to differentiate a repair, which I'm going to take immediately, and an improvement, which is going to last more than one year, going by balance sheet as an, as an improvement that was up there, and take that over five years. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. I'm, I'm just trying to, how, do you, how are you going to differentiate? What's, what's more beneficial, like... Let's say it bought it 17, improved it. Now in 24, I'm re-improving it, yeah. and I'm spending, let's say, another fifteen thousand yeah. dollars. Versus taking that in one year. Well, it's two separate assets, right? right? So the one I put in service in 17 is going to have a life that we're depreciating. Now I've got an improvement in 24. That's a different asset. It's going to show up on my tax returns as a different line item, and that's going to have its own life that's going to get depreciated. So they're separate on your. So if you looked at a company, if you looked at a, a building that had like several years of improvements, but let's take here's a good example of an apartment complex that's got 15, 20 units, and as people move out, they improve the apartment. You could have every year a set of improvements. And they're going to have their own line item and useful life and balance and all of that. So do you see a difference in taking it as one lump versus over five years? Well, you always want to take it in one lump if you can. Okay. Right? We want to we want to jack that loss up and make sure we can, can okay. get as much cash out of this as we can. Now, if your property isn't cash flowing, then a cost is not going to do any good, right? Because you're already not getting any cash out of it. The goal of the cost seg study is so that you're saving taxes and you're getting cash out of this without having to pay tax on the cash. Right. That's the goal. So if your property is in a lost position already, cost seg is not going to help you, and I wouldn't take it. And, and I mean, told people that. I had a, a guy call me two weeks ago and said, I've got this property in my account, so I should do a cost seg. I said, okay, well, you making money on it? Are you cash flowing? He's like, well, not really. Maybe we should wait on that. I'm not going to be any good. I'm happy to take your money, but you're not going to get any value, and I want you to see that value. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. We had a, a question in the chat asking if electrical appliances, they, they kind of be considered in that personal property that I can depreciate. Appliances absolutely are. Yeah, so there's a concept I alluded to, and I'll, I'll rephrase it a little bit. If there is an asset, something in the building that is for the building, and it's fairly permanent, you're probably going to have to capitalize it over that 27 and a half or 39 years. If it's for the business, like an appliance, a machine, um, the carpet, 
you know, that's five year property. You can take that over five years versus the 39 years. And that's a really important distinction, how it is being used and why it's there. It actually, in the court cases, it factors into whether or not you put that in five year or 15 year, or sorry, 39 year property. So it's, it's it becomes a little bit subjective. You gotta be able to prove that. But if you look at our cost sink studies, the full blown ones where we detail every single asset, you're gonna find typically four items for electrical. You're gonna have dedicated um, and convenience for both 240 outlets and for um, 110s. Because some of it's for the building, it's gotta be there. And some of it's not. Your fire system, it's for you guys, it's not for the building. We take that over five years. So try to be a little bit aggressive in terms of how we look at things, because it's important, but you still gotta be able to justify it in the event of an audit. I think you mentioned one time, like if you have a commercial building, like a warehouse that's just open, like you're not going to have usually as many things as like you do, like a like this building has a lot of separate offices. So the more rooms you have and stuff, usually the more there is to depreciate. The more stuff, mm -hmm. you're going to get more things you can move to personal property. But even with a warehouse, you're going to be able to convert, we're going to be able to convert probably 15% of that top line cost and pull that into personal property just because of all the stuff that's in there. Uh, but I mean, the, the easy ones are um, like gas lines that are underground because those are, stay with me on this, because they're underground and not part of the structure, that's personal property for taking over 15 years. Cool. Kind of cool. If the bigger the building, the bigger the line, the more expensive it is, the more cost gets allocated to it. So a good cost seg, all of that allocation and what we call takeoffs is all done by licensed engineers and that's who does all of our takeoff work. It's probably going to be 15 year property. The paint on it, we separate out the paint for the parking stalls. We take that. I know, it sounds silly, but we take it. Um, so, knowing what to look for and how to break that out becomes really, really important. Um, and that's why there's folks like us that do this kind of thing, because it's, um, it's pretty straightforward. But you can do this on rental properties, you can do this on, you know, like if you've got a bunch of, of residential rentals, absolutely want to pick that up. You can get some stuff out of there. Can you explain, I know when we've done these before, y'all often ask us, is, is it vacant or have we already rented it out? Like, if, why do those things matter? What is? Yeah, yeah so um, if it's vacant, it's less important than if you have not put it out for rental yet. So it has to be placed in service. Oftentimes people go out and they buy a property that's not ready for rental yet, so they're gonna go in, they're gonna gut it, they're gonna do some improvements. So they might buy it in January, not available until March, right? Because they got to do a bunch of stuff to get it ready. We wouldn't start taking depreciation until March. Okay. That's the difference. But if in March it's ready and you put it out for rent and it doesn't get rented until June, we're still taking depreciation. So it's vacant is less important than ready for rental. Okay. But thank you for that. That's a good point. Making sense, you guys? Everybody's ready to go buy something? Yeah. <laughs> There's a banker here, they're ready. They're gonna start lining you guys up. One of the things that we'll, I'll pay better attention to next time, but like several of our properties we've got, there's not a whole lot to do to it, you just rent it out. Yep. We've had one in particular that it's taken two years to remodel and do a bunch of stuff. And I didn't realize, like he said, like, you know, doorknobs, all these things that we've just thrown away, like that there was still, value in them that you can depreciate and so, so if you have a big word model just encourage people to itemize every little thing that you you do to it take pictures mm -hmm. right you know if you're gonna throw out a door i don't expect you to try to cost it just take a picture of it show me what it looks like beforehand and then show me what it looks like after we'll come in and take pictures if um if we come out and do a cost segment. but as long as i know what it looked like beforehand and i can look at the before and after i know what was taken out and our engineers can then figure out how big was that wall. They know what's behind it because um, they know what kind of construction it's going to be made out of. And then they will allocate costs to that so that you can pick up some of that disposal cost. Uh, but those pictures on the front end are super important. What if, what if we're going to knock down a whole building and build another building where that is? So like knock down one rental property and put in... Like yeah, you're gonna. I would take. I mean, if you're taking literally taking it down to zero, to take it all out. Um, yeah, I mean that gets into building codes and stuff. I know that in some places, LA being one of them, you can rip out an entire building except one wall, and it's called a renovation. 
<laughs> yeah. Because they don't allow any new construction in the area, so they rip out everything except, you know, one retaining wall and put anything up. But if you're going to take out a whole building, then you're going to want to allocate let some cost to the land, tear it down, take all of it as a disposal for that cost, and then you're going to get 100% of that construction that would come in and do the cost signal. Yep. Oh, you're scratching. Okay. Uh, I'll just, you were probably going to tell people this, but if you're, if you have a property and you're interested or you're just questioning it, like when we talk to you, you're like, just send me the addresses and you had some questions you asked, but then you sent us back for free as like, these are the ones I would recommend. This one, you, you know, it was, you know, some of my, one house we bought a gazillion years ago, it was super cheap and there wasn't enough really left on it or, yep. you know, and so that's what, if you're questioning it, he can help you decide if it's what, how much you would save yep. and, and if it's worth doing or not. So we got connected to um, an investor up in Santa, Kansas City who had 70 properties. So he sent us its appreciation schedules and, you know, once you've taken depreciation over seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, right, your five-year property is gone. So a lot of that's already going to be history. So we took a look at his portfolio and identified about 10 properties out of the 70 that looked like they were good. We will do a, what we call a benefit estimate on anything somebody sends us. And it's going to show you the additional appreciation we think we can generate, as well as the tax savings at 40% federal and state combined. And then it's really up to you whether you want to do the study or not. And if you're going to get $5,000 of benefit, it's going to cost you 6000 for us to do the work. I'm going to tell you, it's probably not worth doing. Now, for some people, if they're going to get 10 and it's going to cost them five, it's still worth it because that's money that they can, again, leverage with the bank and do something with. But we'll lay it out for you in a grid that says, here's all your properties, here's the savings by property. You tell me which ones are important and you think you want us to do go forward on. The other piece you have to look at, and um, working with one of the CPAs we're working with now, she has a client that has eight properties, and she's looking at, going back and doing an amended return on some of them because they want to gather grab some of the tax that this person paid and then do the rest of them in the current year so that she knocks down the tax in the current year and right now she's sitting back with our our benefit estimates going okay how do i maximize the refunds because i've got all these properties and i can generate this much tax savings so that i can get a refund and take over this year's tax versus i'm going to get all the tax i can in this year and then have the losses going forward. Sorry. <laughs> From my Tennessee guys. Um, so that's the other piece of this is you want your CPA involved in this. And we work most of our work comes through CPA firms, so we're not a threat to them. We want we want them to ask for our help so we can all get on the same page. Um, but if you've got multiple properties, part of the big part of this is tax planning. What are your goals today? What are they tomorrow? How does this fit into the bigger picture? But we'll provide all the benefit estimates, no charge. That's an easy one for us. We have a database that takes care of all of that for you. We have a mother. I'm, so they asked, uh, non-load-bearing walls would be personal property. May or maybe even to like aesthetic walls, like partitions or things. Like yeah, that. if they're Office removable. Space. So another concept in cost, I guess, is it removable. So uh, a regular wall that is up that you can't easily remove from the property probably isn't something we're going to be able to pull over. So there's a permanence test that we go through when we look at different assets. Um, but, I mean, I've seen barn doors. Like, this would be probably not, probably couldn't take that. Uh, but if I've got a barn door that I can just lift off and take out, you know, that, that barn door might have cost five grand. I don't want to take that as five-year property. Might be able to do that. So it just depends. Funny thing, bathrooms. If it's in the bathroom, it's 39 or 27 year property. <laughs> Even the towel bar. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But that's what the courts have said. Um, so yeah, so it's uh, it's a fun it's a fun gig, you guys. And more importantly, I'm gonna say it again. One of the best things you can do from a tax perspective to not pay tax legally would be in place that the government didn't want to take advantage of. This is what helps drive the real estate industry, helps people to um, save taxes, use that to create jobs and everything else. Because like, the goal is, I mean, to save money on taxes, but it's really to take that money and go invest and do it again and keep using the money you were going to spend anyway, but instead of giving it to the IRS, you're going to go put, buy an asset that's going to go up in value over time. Yep, absolutely. This is going to help continue to fuel that growth, right? And that's why it's in place. 
Um, so you never know what happens with the government. They do some screwy things with tax law and, and you know, they throw curveballs all the time. Um, I don't think there's a lot of support for getting rid of the 1031 exchange. I think it's just been around for so long and it provides so much value that it doesn't make sense to get rid of it. But I'm not a politician. They make some funny decisions. Um, but I would, I would highly recommend if you're going to get involved in investing in real estate, this is a this is a winner for retirement. Way better than a 401k. So, uh, question: So, if the depreciation, so that's going to go against our income. Yeah. Okay. So, if you're in a 40 percent bracket, you're wiping out some of your 40 percent income. And on the so the downside of it is down the road when we go to sell the property, it's just going to add capital gains, which your capital gains are only going to be at 20 percent. Well. Good thought. I like where you're going, but they, they're on to us. Okay. <laughs> you get twenty. You get capital gains on the difference in your original purchase price and the, and the increase in value. Okay. But the depreciation, you're going to have to pick up that at ordinary gain gain rates, ordinary income rates. So you're going to pay full boat for those okay. in the year that you sell. I can okay. Unless you just give it to your kids and don't worry about it. Okay. Just go buy <coughs> <and> real estate. <laughs> My kids love it when I say things like that. By the way, yeah. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Just dubbed your realtor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm going to be hanging out if you guys have any specific questions that you want to ask, but thank you for, for letting me do this. I appreciate it. And if I can help with anything, let me know. For sure.